Whiskey Jason here, whiskey from the viewpoint of an American over here in Germany tasting, well, rare and exotic whiskey. What else? Today I have Pocono New Zealand Single Malt. I have the Origin, 43%, First Fill Bourbon, Jack Daniel Barrels. I have the Discovery, First Fill Bourbon, Jack Daniels Barrels, and Sherry Cask, Oloroso, and um, Pedro Jimenez. And I have here the Revelation, First Fill um, Bourbon Barrels, and New Zealand Red Wine Barrels. Ooh, yeah! All right, so Pocono. What is Pocono? Pocono is a small town. It's about 53 kilometers, 33 miles, southeast of Auckland and um, has a population of about 5,500 people. Just like we have Linkwood, a very small place in Scotland, we have a very small place in New Zealand called Pocono and they actually built a distillery here. Who are they? According to a very interesting um, article here, um, businessdesk.co.nz from the 4th of September 2022. Um, it's fairly recent. We have a little bit of information about this. We have a man named Matt Johns. Um, Matt Johns comes from the UK, lived in France. And about 10 years ago, moved to New Zealand with his wife, Celine, and his young family. Now, Matt Johns um, has been in the whiskey business since 1999. And he's actually worked, um, for example, with Glen Morangi and Tula Bardeen. So, this original release here, the first worldwide release of these three products will be going to France, UK, Germany, as well as the US market. And so you will actually be seeing this, these products soon. They just hit the German market this literally this week, all right? And um, they are in the New Zealand market, and you can buy the um, for between, is it what, like 100 um, and, well, let's go to the website here, I have it in front of me. So the New Zealand shop. So we're talking about uh, um, 99 New Zealand dollars and 122 New Zealand dollars for this. All right. So what am I going to do? I'm going to talk a little bit about each and every one of these whiskeys. And then I'm going to, towards the end, talk a very briefly about New Zealand whiskey. Did you know that even up to this moment, there is no, there are no rules for New Zealand whiskey? Nothing. So you could call something that was distilled from molasses, not even put into a barrel, but using wood chips. You can add flavoring to it and you could call it whiskey in New Zealand. That's very depressing. At the moment, a little bit inspired by the online Scotch Whiskey Awards and their attempt to categorize whiskeys around the world into a few categories that I did not personally follow. For example, what is a blended malt? outside of Scotland. Hmm. <laughs> so um, I find it very, very interesting at the moment to understand what whiskey is, what categories we have, how useful those categories are, and what category changes might need to be made for the geek or also for the producer or for the normal consumer. So those are things that I have been thinking about a lot at the moment. But we'll talk about that at the very, very, very end. All right. So now, um, Matt Jones, together with his wife, Celine, they found someone in New Zealand named Rowan. Rowan is the master of all trades. He has been a winemaker, beer maker. Now he's a distiller. The guy has done almost everything. And that's very, very good for this distillery. And he is the master distiller there and the plant manager and I think the facility manager as well. What I did not know was that the Pokemon, uh, so Pokemon, I knew I was going to say that, the Pocono, for me as an American, Pocono Mountains up in New York State and even Pennsylvania is what I thought about this when I heard Pocono, uh, but it's Pocono, New Zealand on the South Island. Um, they are geared towards the export market. Up to 95% of everything they produce will not be sold in New Zealand it will actually be exported, which I thought was a lot there. 
All right, so um, Bocano five years ago started off uh, distilling 50,000 liters of pure alcohol. This year, 2022, um, they plan to generate about 70,000 liters. That is not a lot. That's a micro distillery in many places of the world. And the capacity, if they ran 24-7, is 250,000 liters. John's, um, Matt John at the moment is 48 years of age, so not that old. And he moved from France to New Zealand about 10 years ago with his young family and with Celine, his wife. They'd been playing around with the idea of producing whiskey for about 10 plus years. And then finally, 2017, they started actually investing money and making it happen. They got their pot stills from Scotland. Where in Scotland is not mentioned. Was it Forsyth's? Might have been. I don't know. Um, and they also have the right to take up to 100,000 liters of water from the, um, the surrounding volcanic hills um, to, to make whiskey, which is very important. You can't make whiskey without water, and therefore that is a very, 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 very important part. So um, the, the distillery soaked up a lot of capital. Um, Constructed by the um, by Fara Engineering in New Zealand, uh, they have been involved here with the Emerson Brewery, and Pocono's two copper stills were imported from Scotland, which is kind of cool. It costs 1.5 million New Zealand dollars to actually keep the lights on at the distillery every single year, and they have, after three and a half years of production, about 1,800 barrels. And the insurance premiums on those are very steep, he says. Now, to be honest, 1,800 barrels is nothing. <laughs> All right, so um, that is, that's nothing. Yeah, um, that's, that's something I don't actually understand because if you're making 50,000 liters um, a year and you've been doing this four years, um, that's 200,000, ah, okay, yeah, okay, maybe 20, 200 liters per, per thing. That's, ugh, that's really nothing there. Especially if you go to America and you say, hey, we're producing 200 barrels a day. <laughs> and I mean, like, okay, that's like one and a half weeks of production, bam. And that's what they've done in four and a half years. So it's just a totally, totally different thing. Uh, they just brought on an in-house cooper to make barrels. Um, they're currently bought from the Tennessee Whiskey Company, Jack Daniels, and the barrel's lifespan is two distillations. First fill bourbon, okay, well, I don't know if that's one and then one here, or if they'll actually be using them the second time. So it'll be first fill bourbon and second fill bourbon there. All right, so um, that's that. Let's talk about the whiskeys. Now, some of the things they write down on the whiskey makes a lot of sense to me. Some of the things they write down the whiskey is, for me as a geek, not yet satisfying. All right, for example, nowhere on the bottle or on the um, box do we see the word natural color. What a shame. You can see the different colors. This is very, very light. This has the more of the sherry tone. This has a little bit more of the redness of the um, red wine. Why don't you write down natural color someplace? It is 43%. That evil spot between, oh, 40% non-chilled filter is not a possibility. Six, 46%, probably non-chilled filtered. 43 is like, is it non-chilled filtered or not? No information whatsoever. Once again, I have to assume it's colored. My eyes tell me differently, but the label doesn't. And it's probably chill filtered. Ah, why don't you tell us the consumers? All right, so um, Pocono, if you're watching this video, and I hope you do, a little bit more information on those, on that, on the bo bottle, as well as the boxes next time would be much appreciated by us geeks. All right, so on the nose, this is nice. I get a nice little vanilla. I get a little bit of a maltiness. I get a little bit of the icing um, from a cake, and I get a tiny little bit of a lemon peel moment, almost like a little bit of a Sprite Seven Up moment going on here. Not much jumping out of the glass at me, but there's a little bit. Now this is going to be my reference whiskey. Um, this is my. Um, control whiskey that I like to compare it to in this moment and you're gonna say unfair 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 Glen Morangi 10 well it's um, what is it how many what percentage do I have it's 40% and it costs 10 euros less than this does 
All right, so a 10 year old product from Scotland or a probably barely three year old whiskey uh, because that's the rules over here in Europe to be called whiskey. It has to be three years of age. Um, whiskey from New Zealand. Now on the nose, they're very similar. There's that um, barley goodness going on here. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to now, um, yep, all right, here we have my sherry, here we have my red wine, here we have my origin. This actually shows you the origin, the, the starting point of all the whiskeys at Pokemon. Pokemon, Pocono, wow, Jason, it's in my brain. Um, 90 some percent of everything they distill is put into first fill at the moment first fill um bourbon tennessee jack daniels casks cheers mm -hmm. mm. it's hot it's distractingly hot. That's the word I'm going to ask. It's not disturbingly hot. It's distractingly hot. There's a youthful spiritness of this whiskey, which is just hot. Um, I got it the first time I tried it. I got it the second time I tried it. I got it the third time I tried it. Now the fourth time is my glass here. I still get it. Um, it's There is a sweetness here from those good first fill Jack Daniels casks. There's a tiny little bit of a honey going on in there. There's some grapefruit going on there. There's a little bit of citrus going on there and there. There might even be a little bit of a toffee creaminess. Is the whiskey watery? No. Is it really creamy? No. It's a basic, good, solid whiskey. And the thing that I can really, really commend Pocono on is the fact that I would not place this any place else except for if it was blind in Scotland. This feels this taste this acts as if it was a somewhat young not very expensive single malt from scotland which is and i'm going to try to commend the distillery on this an amazing feat for the first whiskey out of the door germany didn't I, there's not a single german distillery that managed that the first time they produced a whiskey um, I, I don't think there's a single distillery in any part of continental Europe that managed that. Everything was like, oh, that's a little bit off. Oh, that's a little bit weird. Oh, that's a little bit, yeah, it's not what it could and should be. This is what it could and should be, just a little bit too young. All right, and so I really, really expect good things here from Pocono. So that being said, would I go out and buy a new bottle of this? I would go buy out, go out and buy another bottle of the Glenmorangi 10, which I do. I give it to the guests. I use it as a um, starting whiskey a lot. This is something that I can just totally 100% get behind and say this is a very, very well-made whiskey. This is a good whiskey, which is well-made, but yet a little too young. Do I want it to be 10 years? No. Do I want it maybe another year and a half in a cask and just let it set there and... And develop a little bit more, yes. And that's what I'm thinking of here. All right. So this is a C whiskey with a C minus value for money. And C whiskeys are actually not bad at all. All right. So now there's one other thing that the company could do to make my life a little bit easier to understand what's going on as a whiskey geek. It's going to be the following. Both of these have the same wording on the pages, and I just don't understand something. All right, it says here, the um, Pocono Discovery celebrates our unique place in the world. Why not? First, we carefully select and blend parcels. Parcel just means uh, a certain amount of casks of stock, which have been fully matured in first fill bourbon, comma, Oloroso and Pedro Jimenez casks. So, not really important, but were these also first fill sherry casks? Or are they just Pedro Jimenez and Oloroso casks? Good. Not the biggest problem here. The problem I have next is we then lay these casks down. We, sorry, we then lay these da back down in cask to allow them to marry perfectly together. What does that mean? Do you take a new cask? Maybe a second fill? 
bourbon casks that you have laying around and put it in there? Do you use the original casks again, the Pedro Jimenez, the Oloroso, and the um, First World Bourbon casks, and put it in there? What do you do? Most companies, um, when they dump something that is fully matured in different um, casks, they put it into a marriaging tank, or marrying tank, um, a, a ton, T-U-N, and they still let it set for weeks and so it can mingle, can marry, can blend together. What does it mean to lay these back down in cask? That's something I stumbled over and dear um, Pocono, if you or the German importer Kamakirsch, if you could explain that in detail to me, it would make my geeky life a little bit more relaxed. All right. So now, if I'm requesting something, I would love to know how long that marrying process was. I would like to, of course, know um, um, what the percentage is of the Pedro Jimenez compared to the Oloroso, compared to the Bourbon is. I'm just going to say my guess is 80% is going to be, um, let's go for... Uh, let's go for 60% bourbon, 20% Oloroso, 20% Pedro Jimenez. I think that's too high with the sherry percentage. I think it's going to be more 70 to 80% of the bourbon and then only 10 to 15% each of the sherry casks. Now, the thing that really surprised slash disappointed me was on the nose, I don't get the sherry. I do get a different nosing moment than the origin. This, by the way, is the discovery. Um, it's interesting, but not typical sherry. So right behind side my right ear, you do see a Glendronach 15 and a Glendronach 21. Those are sherry notes that I recognize. Yeah, the Pedro Jimenez, the Oloroso together, the 15-year-old Glendronach, I recognize that. I don't recognize it here. It's more of like a wine moment a little bit. It's not the typical sherry moment that I know, love, and enjoy. There's not the raisiny type of Pedro Jimenez. There's not the typical spiciness of the Oloroso. It's okay, but it's faint. That's why I think 80% bourbon. And the rest is going to be just that little bit of that full maturation of the sherry casks here. But it's not bad. Cheers. Mm. I get the heat. I don't get as much heat, but I get the heat. Um, oh, by the way... <laughs> If I'm going to ask for details, I would love to know the um, size of the sherry casks. Are we talking about sherry butts? I don't think so. Are we talking about hogsheads? Okay, ah, hogsheads are never used in the sherry industry, so these are actually seasoned casks. Are they oct octaves, maybe even? Something in between. What type of sherry, what size of sherry cask are you, are you using? Bourbon, American Standard Bourbon Barrel. We know what that is. But with um, sherry casks, there's a... A variety of different cast sizes out there. There's still that little heat in the middle there, um, but the flavor towards the end is well done. That's good. This is going to be my um, C to C plus whiskey on the taste. Um, value for money, 47 euros 90 over here, 122 um, Australian, New Zealand dollars over there. Is it worth the money? Would I go out and buy a new one? There is a certain sweetness here. Um, is it a cherry sweetness? Is it a raspberry sweetness? It's a, like a, a wild forest berry sweetness, which is not bad. Um, it's got a nice finish. It's a long finish there. The finish is actually one of the best parts. And I really commend a whiskey that goes like this, and then at the end goes up. And this actually goes up. And I like I so often I have a whiskey, and I, the finish is just so disappointing. And this is like, oh... The heat in the middle is something I'm not particularly keen on, but it's okay. It's it's manageable. It's okay. Um, but 50 euros, my wrong expectations of what the sherry will be like. 
Um, yeah, value for money. This was almost like a C minus C. This is actually a C going towards C plus. And value for money is a C. That's okay. Yeah, not bad, but, but wow. Now, the revelation is the whiskey that I must admit is the one that surprised me positively the most. So we have our same story here. First, we can carefully select and blend parcels of stock which have been fully matured in first fill bourbon and New Zealand red wine cask. What type of red wine? Ah, we would like to know that. Um, from one of our favorite wineries. Not named, but that's okay. Um, we then uh, lay these back down in cask to allow them to marry perfectly together. Once again, <laughs> May I lay them down in cask. What does that mean for how long and why? Now, the nose, this reminded me of Amarone. So there's an Italian um, dark, thick red wine up in the northern Italian regions where they basically hang the grapes up in the attics, turn them in raisins, and then um, turn those raisin types of um, things into wine. Very, very dry, very intensive, very nice. And this is the same thing. This is my favorite. I really, really like the revelation. It was truly a revelation for what New Zealand is doing. And it is somewhat, I'm trying to pick my words carefully here, surprising how well made these whiskies are for the very first edition reaching outside of New Zealand. So many people have put so much whiskey on the market in the last couple of years, way too young. I've been disappointed so many times that I cannot name all of them, um, but this is good. This is good. And that's, that's saying a lot here, right? So, cheers. Mm-hmm. 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 There's a tail, it's still a tiny little bit of heat in the middle. I hope they get that under control in the future. Especially when you're considering this is 43%. But then that wine, that New Zealand red wine moment kicks in. And it just turns this whiskey into something special. There's a um, strawberry moment. There's a, like a strawberry sherbet moment going on here. It's uh, almost a tiny little bit tropical. This is very, very nice. So on the back here, it says um, mango. That was the word I was looking for as well. Mango, grapefruit, strawberry bon um, bonbons. Uh, so, um, are pieces of candy. That, that tropical moment, a little bit of mango, um, a lot more of the um, strawberry and a little bit of that um, creaminess of the sherbet. That is actually well done. This is C++ whiskey, in my opinion. Is it a B minus? No, but it's a C++. And value for money, this is a solid C. If I were going to buy one of these, it would definitely be the Revelation. I think the red wine really, really shines through here. This is what I want. This is what I like. This is very, very nicely done. The Discovery, eh, okay, different than what expected the Sherry didn't really do. The Origin, if you like to have a honest bourbon matured whiskey, this is what you go for. Even though it's a tad too young, um, it's still reasonably priced if you factor in the, um, the trip from New Zealand and it being a craft distillery still down there and making it all the way over here to Europe. Um, Glen Morangi, of course, are producing literally millions of liters of alcohol a year. And here we're having tens and thousands of alcohol liters per year. So, and for that, for the money you pay for this, that 10 euros is not really that badly placed. The bottle design, I must admit, is first class. Um, they did not go for a bottle that is good for the environment. This is heavy. Um, you actually have the little emblem here, um, the spirit of New Zealand. You have a wonderful form for the bottle. Each and every bottle comes with this nice little box here. 
I'm not sure um, about the printing, how environmentally friendly that metallic type of printing is, but that's okay. Um, colored, well done, easy to read, not too small, not too, not too large. Um, there was a, a label added here for Germany. It's on the bottle on the label. They did a very, very good job of that. But of course, somehow the packaging has to also have the, um, the importer on there also today. So that's that. Now, for everyone who wanted to learn about the whiskey, um, you can now turn off. For those of you interested in the rules that the New Zealand Association for um, Whiskey has now um, recommended the guidelines, I would like to briefly go through these, all right? So, if you want to call your whiskey New Zealand whiskey, it has to be, according to the new guidelines, that are not yet law. They are recommendations of the government, and the government will... Um, debate them and review them and talk to the different um, shareholders and then decide on the regulations for the future. But at the moment, the, um, the recommendations are that it has to be mashed, fermented, distilled, matured, and bottled in New Zealand. It doesn't have to be at one site. So you can actually match, mash ferment at some place differently than it being distilled and bottled. So, but it all has to be done in New Zealand. So vatted, it's called blended malt in Scotland now, um, but they're still using the old terminology here, unfortunately. Vatted malt may only contain New Zealand single malt. Okay, that's, that's fine. We don't know the definition of single malt yet, but that's fine. New Zealand blended whiskey, just like we have Scotch blend, um, New Zealand blended whiskey may only contain New Zealand malt whiskey and New Zealand grain whiskey. Grain whiskey is nowhere defined, by the way, interesting enough. And substitution to the malted barley grain must be clearly stated on the front label. For example, if you have a blended whiskey and you have, for example, rye in there, you need to state on the label, all right? Otherwise, we assume that it is a malted whiskey together with grain whiskey. All right, so now we find the definition of the single malt. Single malt whiskey in New Zealand can only be made exclusively from 100% malted cereal grain, not malted barley. Interesting. Um, water, yeast, and batch distilled in a single distillery in pot stills made predominantly from copper. So normally in Scotland and so on, you need to have 100% copper made stills, copper pot stills. No, predominantly. It means you can use um, stainless steel and other things in there as well, which is different. And the thing that really, really caught my eye, 100% malted cereal grain, not barley. So if you put 80% uh, malted barley, 20% malted rye, it's still a single malt. Would not be the case in any other country of the world that I know of. Hmm. If that's a good idea, I'm not sure. What I also thought that was good is the next one. All of the fermentable sugars must be derived from cereal grain. Enzymes are permitted in New Zealand whiskey, but not in single malt New Zealand whiskey. So if you're using malted grains, um, you cannot use enzymes. All right, so if you are using here other types of grains, cereal grains, um, and you're just making New Zealand whiskey, you can add enzymes. All right, Scotland forbids the use of enzymes. Um, America and Germany, we use enzymes all the time. So coloring all may be added to for the purpose of consistency and then only natural coloring. The E150A can be used, the burnt sugar. All right, what a shame. I mm, That'd be a great thing to have. Um, the maximum distillation is 94.8%. Alcohol by volume. I thought scotch was 94.6. Mm. All right. There might be something even higher. Um, bottled as a minimum of 40% alcohol by volume. And here, this is an interesting thing as well. Matured in wooden casks, not oak, wooden cask, a maximum 700 liters for no less than two years. Europe, three years. Ireland, three years. Scotland, three years. Canada, three years. New Zealand, two. Hmm. Age statements must state the age of the youngest whiskey. And then the last one, the production of New Zealand whiskey cannot involve commercially produced liquid malt extract, flavoring ingredients such as wine, beer, honey, sweeteners, or spices, hmm. 
or wood chips during maturation. That's very, very interesting. So single malt got around that problem by basically saying single malt Scotch whiskey is made from water, yeast, artificial coloring, and malted barley. That's it. Those four factors. Everything else is not allowed. Now, um, <laughs> is it allowed to use a beer cask finish? Is it allowed to use a wine cask finish? Apparently, yes. Is it allowed to use a honey cask finish? Is it allowed to um, use wood chips? No. So, um, that's something that I don't know of any regulations where that is um, forbidden. So, wood chips. I don't know if it's forbidden in the European Codex. It's not explicitly stated anywhere. In Scotland, I know in the rules it's not explicitly stated. But therefore, if it's not allowed, it's forbidden. It's forbidden. And in America, I do know we use wood chips. Um, let's talk about Maker's Mark 46 and all their private selects that they put the new staves in there and so on and so on and so on. Mm. All right, that's that. So these, this was adapted from the New Zealand Whiskey Guidelines and Definitions of the um, Distilled Spirits. And now I need to have the my pronunciation of this word. So the, the uh, Maori word for New Zealand is? Aotearoa. Aotearoa. And that's actually here on each and every bottle at the top here. We have New Zealand. We have the um, word of um, the native Maori language on there as well. And it's called the Aotearoa um, Council. So that's something that's good. All right. So a long video, but a lot of information about New Zealand whiskey. New Zealand is one of the few countries of the world that actually had no distilleries for a few years. I think one of them closed down in 1999. Which one was it? Um, real quick. So, do, 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 do. Um, we now have, for example, other distilleries. Um, Willowbank, yes, exactly. The Willowbank shut down in the late 1990s. And um, so we have at the moment. Um, Pocono that is producing for the export market as well as Cardrona. So they have a 2,000 um, liter wash still and a 1,300 liter spirit still. Um, but according to the um, Whiskey Society in New Zealand, about 80% of Kiwi whiskey production is currently destined for the domestic market, while a mere 20% goes abroad. And that is actually what um, Cardrona is sending to the UK. And now with 95% of what uh, Pocono is going to send around the world, that figure is about to change a lot. So my question of the day is, do we need another distilling country of the world? We've had Thailand with Kavalan, we've had India, Paul John and Amrut and so uh, Rampoa, we have now Amorik um, with um, France. We have all these other countries producing whiskey as well. Star Ward down in Australia. And now we have oh, New Zealand as well. Do we really need it? I'd say yes. I love that variety. I love the fact that different people are producing different products in different manners and trying to highlight their heritage as well as their homegrown products. We'll see if they're a success or not. I wish them all the best, and I hope that we have more products like the Revelation, like the Origin, a little bit older, a little bit better, and even a little bit more of a, for me, I just have to get used to a typical sherry moment that's a little different. Thank you. All the best. Whiskey Jason here talking about rare and exotic whiskeys, this time for New Zealand. Bye-bye.